All right. Well, I know what you're thinking. Where's Scott? <laughs> and what happened to Romans? We had just finished chapter four. We were moving into chapter five. It was so good. And... on for just a second. Okay. All right. While I get situated, you open to Jonah. And that should give me plenty of time. <laughs> Jonah. We are going to make our way through the book of Jonah over the next five weeks. And look at what God's word has to say to us from this precious book in our Bible, this minor prophet, Jonah. We're going to go through it together. And if you listen quietly, you might be able to hear the person next to you singing the books of the Old Testament to find where Jonah is. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel. Okay, I won't do that. Now, when most people think of Jonah, what do they think of? Jonah and the whale or fish, right? There's both sides, either you're a Jonah and the whale person or a Jonah and the fish, and we're just going to let the gospel keep peace among us, regardless of where you stand. But we think of Jonah and the fish or Jonah and the whale, and I think it's important that right from the start, we recognize what the book of Jonah is actually about. We're going to spend the next five weeks, and I'm going to give you a spoiler, all right? The book of Jonah is about God. The book of Jonah is about God. God is the primary person, the primary one acting, the primary character of the book of Jonah. And in the book of Jonah, we see the way that God is. We see how God rescues people. The book of Jonah reveals to us the character of God, and we see how God cares for the wrong thinking of even one of his own. And in this book of Jonah... God shows us something about the way God rescues people. God loves, God loves to rescue people. Anyone who has fellowship with God and is at peace with God is only in that state because God has rescued them. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are only a follower of Jesus Christ because God has rescued you from the domain of darkness and transferred you to the kingdom of his son. Most often, God rescues people from themselves and God rescues them from himself. He rescues us from ourselves because as unbelievers, we are dead in our sin and we want nothing to do with him, as we've been seeing in Romans. And he rescues us from himself because the unbeliever is under condemnation in their sin. And the unbeliever is under the righteous, just judgment of God. We need to be rescued from that. And Yahweh God is a God who is full of grace and full of mercy and full of love. And what we see without a shadow of a doubt is the reality that God is a God of compassion. He's long-suffering, slow to anger, full of kindness and love and grace and mercy. He is indeed a God of compassion. And compassion, what is this? Compassion is the quality of showing kindness or favor or of being gracious or of having pity or mercy. And that is God in this book. That is God in the book of Jonah. In fact, that is God in the Bible. And so this five-week series through the book of Jonah, we're going to call Jonah and the God of Compassion. Jonah and the God of Compassion. God loves to rescue. He loves to extend his compassion to those who don't deserve it. And the book of Jonah tells us what lengths God will go to to rescue the pagan and what lengths God will go to to rescue his own people from their own foolishness. And God does this. God is not waiting for people to act. He's not simply put out an offer and hopefully someone will respond to his offer. God did not put out an offer only to helplessly wait for people to act. God is not waiting around on man. And in the book of Jonah, God literally 
turns things upside down to accomplish his will. And it was his plan all along. It's not as though he's trying to catch up with Jonah. God is good. He is completely sovereign. Nothing ever catches God by surprise. And as we go through this book together, what we're going to see is that God uses unworthy servants to proclaim his word. He will send storms. He will command creation in a fish. He will call on winds. He will call a worm out of the ground to bring about his providence and his will. He'll cause a tree to grow up to prove a point to someone. And not only that, but the book of Jonah also shows us what God will do to rescue one of his own who's walking in disobedience. And we can relate to this, can't we? This is helpful for us. If you are a Christian, you know what it's like to need rescuing from yourself, even in a redeemed state. We get distracted We sin, we do the things we don't want to do, we get entangled and we subject our blood-bought souls to sin that we are to be dead to. We are, as we sing, prone to wander and prone to leave the God that we love. We at times seek to go our own way. And the book of Jonah gives us hope that God cares about those who are his Hebrews 12, 6, for those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. In Jonah, we get to see that played out. And in the book of Jonah, we see a glimpse of what God is willing to do to glorify himself and to bring good to his people. So grateful that the book of Jonah is in our Bibles. Let's look together at the first three verses. Jonah 1, starting in verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So he went down to Joppa, found a ship which was going to Tarshish, paid the fare, And went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the prophet Jonah, who we can most definitely relate to. And Lord, we pray for the next five weeks as we go through this book as a church body Pray that you would help us to see what we must about you and that you would help us to see what we must about ourselves. We pray that you would make us more like your son as we bring our hearts to your word, mold us and shape us, that we would be grown in our faith and deepened in our love and our affection and our awe of our great God, you. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God here in these first three verses commissions Jonah. This really sets the stage for us for the book of Jonah. God is commissioning Jonah to go to Nineveh. And God's commissioning of Jonah unfolds in two shocking events. We can break down these first three verses into two events that really should catch our attention. There are two events here or two scenes that unfold unfold that should catch our eye, that should grip our heart, that need to catch our attention. God is commissioning to go to Nineveh, and as he does that, there are two events that we're going to fix our attention to on today. First, the first shocking event is this, that God's word comes to Jonah. We see that from the very beginning. God's word comes to Jonah. Look at the first part of verse one. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. And as we discussed before, the book of Jonah is about God. God is the key figure. And here we see that right off the bat, right from the beginning, the first action of this book is God's action. 
the word of the Lord came to Jonah. The word of the Lord came to him. And Jonah doesn't tell us how God's word came to him, but he says it came. And we know from Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, that God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways in these last days, has spoken to us in his son. And so here, God's word comes to Jonah, and this could have happened in many different ways, and God didn't think it was important to tell us precisely the specifics, but that his word came to Jonah. It's important that we recognize God is acting, God is working, God is at the center of what's going to be taking place here. God has a plan. He has a purpose, he has a goal, and he is choosing to bring into his plans and his purposes Jonah. And so God brings his word to Jonah, his servant, for his purposes. God is commissioning Jonah with a message to take to Nineveh. And you may be asking, you may be wondering, why is that shocking? Why is it shocking that God's word would come to a prophet? And if you're asking yourself that question, let me gently inform you, dear friend, that your senses have become dull. Yahweh God, the God who created the heavens and the earth, the one who spoke creation into existence and breathed life into dust, the eternally existing, all-powerful, all-knowing God has his sovereign will and in his kindness and love and compassion, he condescends and comes to a self-righteous, sinful man who represents a wayward people to carry his truth as a means to accomplishing his purposes. That is shocking that God would do that. Just in that first phrase that the word of the Lord came to Jonah is so much about the richness of God's love and mercy and compassion. He's a gracious God that he would allow us to participate in his work. That he would let us be stewards of his word. That he would let Jonah here carry his message to Nineveh. Jonah should have been undone at the fact that Yahweh was speaking to him. A wealth of riches about our God is put on display in his word coming to Jonah. And it's even all the more impressive when we consider some things about Jonah and some things about Israel. Who is Jonah? Well, we know very little about Jonah. The only other place in the Old Testament where he is mentioned is 2 Kings 14, 25. But we find that he was a prophet from the northern kingdom and was from the tribe of Zebulun. He grew up not far from Nazareth, just a few miles away, in fact. And if we, read, if we just read Jonah, it seems that he never really got his act together. We don't see him repent. We don't him say, see him say, you're right, Lord. And there are some good observations that we'll be making regarding Jonah as we go through this book. We'll attempt to make sense of these things, but it's important for us to remember that what we get is a snapshot into the life of Jonah in God's word. It's not the entirety of Jonah's life. And like all of us, he is a man with feet of clay He was not perfect. He had his struggles and his sins. He would do things that make you scratch your head. But in the book of Jonah, we get a snapshot, not the whole picture of this man. And there is actually some comfort for us seeing Jonah in some of his worst moments. Because I guarantee you, each one of us, if we were thinking rightly about the gospel and what God has done in his son for us, we would scratch our heads too at some of the things that we do. Some of the things that we say, some of the ways that we respond. And so let us not rush too quickly to a self-righteous judgment over Jonah, but rather let us learn from him. Let us be challenged by him. Now Jonah also was a successor to Elisha. And why is the context of 2 Kings important? What's going on here? Well, times are really good for Israel. Times are really good from a worldly perspective in Israel, but this is from a worldly perspective only that we can say that. 
Jeroboam II was king of Israel and had greatly expanded the borders and there was prosperity. This is around 760 BC. And just as a reminder, the kingdom split at the end of Solomon's reign in 931 and divided into the northern tribes of Israel and the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, which were referred to as Judah. And Jonah is a prophet of the northern tribes. Things are weak in Assyria in this moment. That's where Nineveh is. And the country that was going to demolish Israel shortly, they were now having their way with. Israel was having their way with Assyria at this time. Times are good from a worldly perspective for Israel. And this is important to understand that just because things are going well for a country doesn't mean God's blessing is automatically upon it. If you think that things going really well from a worldly perspective is a sign of God's blessing upon you or upon your country, you're mistaken. You're using the wrong test. If you think things are going really well right now for you from a worldly perspective and therefore God's blessing is clearly upon you, that may be true. But if you're making that conclusion based off of the fact that there is prosperity, worldly prosperity, and that's the conclusion you can then make, then you are mistaken. And sadly, it seems that most often when things are going best for us from a worldly perspective, we are most susceptible to apathy towards God or self-reliance apart from God or even legalism in our religious pursuit of God to think that we have something to do with it, that we're playing a part more than God, above God. So while from a worldly perspective, things are going great, the reality is that spiritually all was not well in Israel. While they're experiencing worldly riches, at this time, they are in spiritual poverty. There is idolatry, there is corrupt leadership, justice is being perverted morally, ethically, socially, There is spiritual poverty, and Israel is simply going through the motions, and Jonah is doing the same thing. Jonah is an expression of this. You see, Jonah is a prophet to Israel, but Jonah is also a demonstration of what is going on in Israel. He's a representative to Israel on behalf of God, and he is a representative of what is really going on spiritually in Israel. Jonah was, in a sense, a mirror for Israel to hold up and to look at itself. Hosea was similar in this way. Hosea was a representative representative who was raised up to speak to Israel, but he's also a representative to Israel of what's going on in the country. And Jonah is also a demonstration of what is going on spiritually in Israel. They were going through the religious motions, but were experiencing spiritual poverty of the heart. And in verse one, the the word of the Lord comes to Jonah. And then in verse two, we see what God says to Jonah. And he says, arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it for their wickedness has come up before me. So the fact that God's word came to Jonah Just that fact is shocking. But it seems Jonah is more caught off guard by what God actually says and commissions him to do than he is at the fact that the creator of the heavens and the earth is coming to him and giving him a message to proclaim on his behalf. God calls Jonah to go with this message and to go to Nineveh. And God uses the term great city to describe Nineveh. He'll do that several times in this book. And Nineveh was a big city, but it was also an important city. It was a strategic city. It is believed to have been the capital city of the Assyrian kingdom. And it was on the eastern bank of the Tigris River. It was an old city even in that day. And today it is where Mosul, Iraq is. What should Jonah do there? He's to cry out against it. You see that in verse two? Arise, go to, the great, to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it. 
He's to cry against it because their wickedness, the wickedness of the people, has come before the Lord. And Jonah was not instructed to bring a message of hope or of forgiveness. Jonah was simply to go and to declare that the Ninevites were sinful people and that their wickedness had come up before the Israelite God. Graphic, ugly, horrific Sin was taking place in Nineveh. From the top to the bottom of the social classes, sin was rampant. Kings and leaders were wickedly cruel. And this place was not on Jonah's radar for Yahweh to take anything or to have anything to do with. Jonah had no desire to bring this message to Nineveh. We have to ask ourselves the question, why is Jonah reluctant? It may be because of how sinful the city was. It may have been because they were historically cruel to Israel. It may be because as a contemporary of Hosea and Amos and their messages, Jonah feared he would be used to help the enemy who would later destroy his own nation. And as we make our way through the book of Jonah, we'll see some of the reasons why he didn't want to go there. But whatever the reason, God's word comes to Jonah and brings instruction for Jonah. And Jonah is at a crossroad. What is he going to do? So here God is commissioning Jonah to go to Nineveh. And the first shocking event that takes place is that God brings his word to Jonah. The grace and the compassion and the kindness of God is put on full display that he would use a sinner to carry his message to Nineveh. But next we see what Jonah does in response to this. And the second shocking event that unfolds in God's commissioning of Jonah is that God's word is disobeyed by Jonah. Number two, God's word is disobeyed by Jonah. First, God's word comes to Jonah, and now we see Jonah's response, and that's one of disobedience. We see that in verse three. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. This is the extreme opposite of what God told Jonah to do. Tarshish was a Phoenician colony of what would later be Spain. And instead of going 500 miles northeast to Palestine, or from Palestine, he attempts to voyage 2,000 miles west. Jonah just wanted to get away from his problem that the Lord set before him. And in this case, Jonah actually views God as his problem. He's fleeing the presence of the Lord. He not only doesn't want to do what God has instructed him, but he wants nothing to do with the instructor. If you have children, you've probably experienced this with maybe your toddler. Hold daddy's hand. And all of a sudden, not only is your child not holding your hand, but like a lightning bolt, they're running the other direction. I've just observed that, and none of us have actually experienced that, right? Our kids would never do something like that. That's something we see by other parents at Target, right? (laughs) Jonah is running from the presence of God. It's Jonah here. God gives him instruction and he wants nothing to do with that instruction. He's running from the instruction and running from the instructor. And so Jonah's response is, why, Lord, would you go to them and extend your mercy? The creator of the heavens and the earth, Yahweh God, the God of the nation of Israel, has come to Jonah, appointed him as a prophet, given him his word to take to people whom he desires Jonah to take it to, which is just unbelievable in the first place. And Jonah's response is no, no. No, God. And something going on inside of Jonah thinks he knows better to go- than God in this moment. You don't know the people. You don't know how sinful they are. I know what you're like. They don't deserve you. And so he runs. Jonah's response is, why, Lord, would you go to them and extend your mercy even in a message of judgment? Why would you even address such an evil people? And this reveals a very self-righteous view that Jonah possesses. He's all good with God's care for people when it's his people. But these people don't fit Jonah's mold. They don't fit into Jonah's box of who God is for. And so he is disgruntled in this moment. And we just have to ask ourselves the question, 
What ways does this kind of thinking come out in us? Have you ever prejudged someone's fitness for the gospel? Have you ever prejudged someone's fitness to hear the gospel? They would never come to faith in Jesus. They're too lost. They're too sinful. They're too wicked. Or maybe simply in your heart, you deem someone unforgivable. You don't want to see them repent. They don't deserve God's kindness. They don't, reserve, they don't deserve salvation. If you just knew what they did, if you knew what they have done, they are so bad and such awful sinners. They have done such horrendous things and they don't deserve God. Well, you know what? Praise God, he didn't deem you unforgivable that he didn't deem me unforgivable. unforgivable. He had every right to with each one of us. There's not one of us that falls into the category of forgivable or deserving of God's grace or kindness. But he is a God of compassion. Not one person he has extended his mercy to ever deserved that mercy. But Jonah doesn't see that. Jonah's defiant. He does not want to follow God's instruction. God's instruction is a problem for him, and he just wants to get away from his problems. He becomes the perfect Southwest Airlines commercial, want to get away. Jonah does. He wants nothing to do with God. He's defiant. He doesn't want to follow God's instruction. God's instruction is before him, and he is running. Have you ever been like Jonah in this way? Something unexpected comes into your life, you do not like it, and you just simply want to get away? I just don't want to deal with it? Maybe it's not only something you don't like, but it is a trial, and the weight of it feels crushing, When have you thought, I just just want to get away from my problems. I just want to escape. I need a break. In fact, many sins are committed from people trying to get away from their problems. Drugs, alcohol, relationships, all sorts of addictions and outlets for people to try to escape what the sovereign and good and holy God has allowed to come into their lives. We will so easily be sucked into something seeking to escape our problems as opposed to trusting a God who is sovereign in and over our problems. And Grace Bible Church, this is a temptation for each one of us, but I want to take a moment to commend you. I want to take a moment to commend you. This season has been a challenging season with losing three precious saints in our church And you all in love have pressed on, enduring and trusting and fighting for joy in your sorrow and peace. And you all in love have extended that love that you have received from God to one another, these precious families, and that is his grace in your life. So praise God for that. And yet the temptation to want to simply escape and to want to run and to want to get away from hard things is real. And ultimately the problem with wanting to get away from your problems is you can't get away from your problem because at the heart of your problem is your heart. Maybe to say it a different way, there's no escaping your problems because the root of all your problems is you. Jonah's problem wasn't going to an Assyrian city who hated Israelites and proclaiming a message of judgment. That wasn't his problem. That was God's will for him. That was his instruction to him. His problem was his own lack of faith and trust in his God. And it's the same for us. 
ultimately, our problems are not what is going on around us, but it's what is going on in us. Has God not told us that he is seated on his throne and does all that he pleases? Has God not told us in his word that he causes all things to work for good to those who are his? Has he not proven time after time to use the evil of man to accomplish his good? And yet it is so easy to lack faith, to not trust, to think we see a fuller picture of God And this thinking is really at the heart of all discontentment. When things don't go the way we want, the way we think is right, and we sin in response, we are saying in our actions, God, you don't understand. You don't really know what is good. I know better. You don't see what I see. And that's Jonah here. God gives him instruction, and he wants nothing to do with it. In one sense, Jonah's disobedience, God's instruction is shocking when we're thinking rightly about God. But in one sense, it's not shocking because we can personally and intimately relate with that kind of thinking and that kind of response to God's instruction. What instruction has God given you, believer, in his word, in your Bible, that you want to get away from? That you don't want to submit your life to in obedience? Galatians tells us to put aside the deeds of the flesh, which includes things like outbursts of anger. But you don't understand, it's just so frustrating Really? God doesn't understand? Lust, immorality, jealousy, greed, envy, idolatry. But you don't know what I've been through. You don't know what others did to me. Did God not know what Israel had been through with the Assyrians? Jonah no doubt knew Israelites who had been killed by Assyrians. How about one another instructions? Put aside all bitterness. But but you don't know what they did to me. You don't know what they said. You don't know how they treated me. You don't know how it made me feel. Confess your sins to one another. I've been vulnerable in the past and I got burned. I'm not doing it again. How about this one? Do not forsake the assembling of believers. What is your involvement in the body of Christ like? Now again, another opportunity to commend you. You guys love and serve and fellowship and participate in so many ministries in this church and in each other's lives in this church so well, but it's a good question to ask. But work is really busy right now. It's a tough season with our children. It's easy to find excuses to run from God's instruction and to doubt that God's instruction is good and to get caught up in things of the world and to forget that God is a loving father who only gives good gifts to his children. As we watch Jonah run from God after receiving instruction from God, it is a good opportunity to take spiritual inventory in our own lives and in our own hearts and to really evaluate if our hearts are in submission to God or are we simply looking for an out like Jonah did? There are clearly seasons and circumstances that limit our availability, but it is a good question to ask. Am I currently limited because of what God has brought into my life or because of what I have brought into my life and I need to recalibrate some things and some priorities so that I can be faithful to God's instruction? 
Jonah is a good picture of the reality that in wanting to get away from the instruction, you are really wanting to get away from the instructor. Every time we run away from God's word and from God's instruction in our life, we inevitably are running away from him. Here, Jonah wants to get away from the Lord. And two times in verse three, he wants to get away from the presence of the Lord. So much so in verse two, there's actually a play on words in the original. In verse two, it says, arise and go to Nineveh. That's God's instruction. And in verse three, Jonah arose and went the other way. That's Jonah's response. God commissions Jonah and Jonah rebels. This is just the beginning of the story. This is just the beginning of the story of Jonah and the God of compassion. And there is comfort for us because what we will see is that Jonah's rebellion, Jonah's sin, does not thwart the purposes of God. And just because Jonah sought to flee from God's presence doesn't mean God let him. God isn't done with Jonah. God loves his children and he bears with them patiently and lovingly and he will go to great lengths to rescue his children. We know this to be true, especially this side of the cross. We see God go to great lengths in the book of Jonah to rescue his people. And this is really just a foreshadow of the ultimate expression of his love and mercy and grace and compassion that he has shown to everyone who believes upon him. The God of Jonah is the same God of the New Testament. And and that God sent his son to take on flesh and sent his son to live perfectly in obedience to the law and to only ever do what was pleasing to the father and then for the father to take the punishment and the wrath that was deserved for those whom he would save and to place it on his son. And there Jesus died as the perfect substitute to satisfy the penalty that you deserve in your sin, that I deserved in my sin. And he saved us from the penalty of sin and he saved us from being enslaved in our sin to our sin. And just as we will see, God literally forced Jonah into submission. God also cares for us when we wander and when we stray. And all of this is made possible because of Jesus. Praise God that he intervenes in the lives of rebellious sinners. Praise God that he intervenes in the straying of his own. Do you know Jesus? Have you, have you experienced Jesus in this way? Have you found forgiveness of sins in him? Have you repented from your life of wanting to live for yourself in rebellion to God and turned away from that life to him of wanting to live for him, trusting in his work, in his son, as the only means of being in fellowship with him, as the only satisfactory payment for your sins so that you could be made right with God? Has that happened in your life? If not, being here this morning, hearing this message, may be God's stepping into your life and rescuing you. Repent of your sins. Turn to Jesus. Trust him with your life. He is faithful and he is good. He knows better than we know. He has accomplished what we cannot and he has given to those who are his a great hope. He only brings good, even when it's hard, even when we don't understand. Jonah clearly did not have a category for any word of God to go to Nineveh. But God did. And God does amazing, unthinkable, miraculous things through it. Let's pray.
God, we, we just need to be in awe. We need to be in awe of your kindness to sinners. We need to be in awe of your will and your sovereignty that you could use even wicked responses and you can intervene and orchestrate and call upon winds and pagan sailors and fish and plants and worms to accomplish your will. There is no God like you. And Lord, I pray that our hearts would be captivated. I pray that we would be comforted. I pray that we would be spurred on. Thank you for being near to us, even in our rebellion. Thank you for providing your son. Thank you that we can serve you and love you and live for you. Help us now, even Lord now, to respond in song with hearts that have been captivated by your truth. I pray that wherever our affections are in this moment, that as we sing, you would align our hearts with the truth of your word, and that that would bear itself out in our week, in the coming months and years, that we would be faithful, trusting servants of the most holy, loving, compassionate God. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.